world faces major challenges. FIU has the solutions and top talent to make an impact. Here in Washington, D.C., we're achieving results through people, policy, and partnerships. We're making great strides in Congress, at federal research agencies, and from our own FIU in D.C. on Capitol Hill. We're bringing our A-game to transform our hometown and the world. As a top-ranked Carnegie Research Institution and the fourth largest university in the country, FIU is uniquely positioned to help our federal partners on key challenges. They invest in our research initiatives, they visit our campuses in Miami and D.C., and they use FIU and D.C. as their own access point for success. Our students and faculty see FIU and D.C. as a lab, where ideas from the classroom are put into practice on a real-time global stage. And our dynamic hub on Capitol Hill punches above its weight class, providing faculty researchers a platform to assert leadership in national dialogues and giving our alumni and visiting partners a place to call their own. So are you ready? Ready to make an impact? Ready for your next horizon? Welcome, Welcome to, to FIU, FIU in Washington, D.C. Good morning, everyone. Uh, on behalf of FIU, both uh, in our hometown uh, of Miami, uh, where we're broadcasting, as well as here in Washington, D.C., uh, for this exciting idea exchange series this morning. Uh, we're eager today to explore and envision what a collaborative ecosystem could be uh, if we are to diversify uh, uh, our country's tech uh, ecosystem. Uh, we're so excited that uh, so many are joining us here today uh, via Zoom or Facebook. Uh, we know that this is not the first uh, nor the last discussion of this type, uh, but we're excited to get uh, everyone's ideas and our uh, panelists' um, uh, thoughts and perspectives. Uh, we know that this is a very opportune moment uh, in our country uh, where universities, corporations, uh, governmental players are eager for collaboration uh, and with a special eye towards the tech sector, uh, which uh, I think we'll hear today is very uh, welcome of, of ideas. A um, uh, bit of uh, housekeeping before we begin. Uh, tuned in today uh, throughout the country are faculty and students from our uh, country's minority serving institutions, Hispanic serving institutions, uh, HBCUs, uh, corporate leaders uh, like our friends at Verizon and SoftBank that you'll hear from uh, shortly, foundations, associations, uh, and uh, even some friends from the Hill and federal agencies. Uh, special shout out and thanks to our partners at STEM Connector. Uh, who have uh, helped support today's dialogue, and you'll meet one of uh, their leaders uh, on uh, shortly. Um, and we're excited that uh, here in Washington, D.C., uh, in the midst of these uh, uh, this week, uh, is, a, is a great uh, dynamic group of 25 uh, students that are uh, tackling the same very question, uh, and will be uh, working on some policy uh, hackathon solutions uh, relevant to uh, a challenge that has been asked of the, uh, the, the country that you'll also hear about. Uh, before we move on, uh, we want to encourage all of the, those of you that are logged on, please use your chat feature. Uh, give us a quick introduction. Who are you? Uh, but also, let's start the ideas flowing. Um, are there questions that you would like this discussion to uh, address? Uh, any ideas of your own uh, on the, the key question at hand? Uh, throughout the program, we'll also be prompting uh, some poll questions that uh, as well. We'll start off with some quick uh, federal greetings uh, from some key players. Uh, one of our uh, students uh, uh, from our current fly-in will uh, set uh, some of the context, uh, and then we'll jump right into two uh, distinct panels. One focused more on university, directly on university corporate collaboration, uh, and a second looking at uh, what some innovative regional approaches are, uh, place-based, uh, city-led or, or corporate-led. Um, and really the takeaways uh, that we expect uh, on behalf of FIU, but also our, our partners at uh, the many Hispanic serving institutions and HBCUs, is we really like to, to think through what, uh, uh, what are those calls to action um, and what uh, can these institutions as a coalition be, uh, be doing in unison. So uh, that being said, uh, before we begin, we wanted to um, uh, hear some greetings from our own uh, hometown Congresswoman and Chair uh, Frederica Wilson. Unfortunately, she could not join us in person today because starting uh, within minutes is a very important hearing on the Hill uh, that she will be chairing uh, focused on uh, higher education and, uh, and COVID response. But uh, let's cue the tape from Congresswoman Wilson. Hello, everybody. I'm Congresswoman Frederica Wilson from Florida District 24. 
thank you so much for joining us today for this important national dialogue. I am so delighted that Florida International University has assembled so many minority serving institutions and historically black colleges and universities to help build a sustainable pipeline to diversify the tech sector. As chair of the Higher Education and Workforce Investment Subcommittee, this goal and the success of these institutions are top priorities of mine. I am a former educator, a lifelong educator, I must say. I recently chaired the first congressional hearing in over a decade to focus exclusively on HBCUs, and I look forward to hosting future hearings on how Congress can best support MSIs and their students. That is why today's discussion is so, so critical. I would like to thank FIU for taking such a strong leadership role in Miami and nationwide to shine a light on the need to diversify our tech jobs. We all know FIU's College of Engineering and Computing is number one in the nation in awarding engineering and computing degrees to Hispanic students and to other minorities. I am so proud to proclaim that many of them are products of the 5,000 Role Models of Excellence program at Miami-Dade County Public Schools. And just last year, FIU's College of Engineering and Computing, the faculty secured nearly $45 million in research awards. With FIU's leadership, along with key support from the private sector, my hometown of Miami is creating a hub of diverse talent and innovation. And I will continue to work with the Biden administration, Congress, and other stakeholders to support these efforts and ensure that there are opportunities and high growth jobs for the next generation of innovators from underrepresented backgrounds. We must seize this important moment to meet the demands of our students and the tech sector. If we follow the talent, we will land straight on the doorsteps of our minority serving institutions and historically black colleges and universities. Have a great, great conference. God bless you and God bless America. All right, thank you, Congresswoman Wilson. Uh, we are very excited and uh, uh, pleased and honored uh, that this morning uh, representing the White House and the Office of Science Technology Policy uh, is Dr. Jedida Isler, uh, an astrophysicist uh, by discipline, uh, but she serves as the Assistant uh, Director uh, of STEM Opportunity and Engagement at the Science Division within uh, OSTP, as it's known uh, short. Uh, we're excited to hear from her, uh, and as we will uh, uh, learn from her, this is a very timely week for this discussion, and uh, uh, let me, without further ado, uh, Dr. Isler. Good morning or good local time, everyone. Thank you so much, Carlos, Kimberly, and your team for the opportunity to speak here um, at this uh, very important event. Uh, you are correct. I am the Assistant Director for STEM Opportunity Engagement here at OSTP in the Science and Society Division, uh, which in and of itself is an inaugural division um, that is one of many structural changes OSTP Director Eric Lander um, and this administration have put in place to signal both the office and this administration's commitment not only the science and technology policy uh, that, that benefits the entire nation, but also to listening to uh, the communities and all of America about um, science and technology policy. So um, this inaugural division um, is sort of fully recognizing the fact that a robust and growing science and technology, engineering and mathematics ecosystem is the cornerstone for the current and future health, prosperity and security of this country. Um, and President Biden has 
signaled his unequivocal commitment uh, to decisive action that benefits the nation in his series of day one executive orders on equity, um, including his imperative that the US government pursue a comprehensive approach to advancing equity for all, including people of color and others who have been historically underserved, marginalized, and adversely affected by persistent poverty and inequality. So OSTP is committed to embedding these Biden-Harris administration priorities, including racial equity, gender equity, scientific integrity, and increased public trust in science into, into the science and technology ecosystem. Uh, many of the Biden-Harris key policy priorities from pandemic preparedness um, to clean energy, environmental justice, tech, cybersecurity, supply chain independence, and um, environmental justice, and many, many more, the technologies, industries, and as Chairwoman uh, Wilson just commented, the, the good paying jobs of the future all rely on scientific te technology skills and expertise. And President Biden's enduring commitment to science and technology was also on display um, in this recent Biden infrastructure deal uh, through significant investment in energy technology, research and development and renewable energy, climate, advanced manufacturing, um, removing lead pipes in the homes and buildings that har could harm children, and equitable provision of broadband for all of America. Um, we're very excited about these uh, recent wins on behalf of the American people. Um, and, and their hearty affirmation of science and technology as core uh, to the nation's continued success and equitable and far reaching participation in and contribution to uh, science and technology are not merely nice to have. Um, I know I, I have um, a wide agreement here that they're required. Uh, in, in three critical ways. Uh, the first is they're the bedrock of new science and tech innovations and insights. Um, scientific progress depends on people perceiving things through different lenses with different experiences and different questions. Um, it's how America remains globally competitive. And we're home to 4% of the world's population. So in order to continue leading um, on these technologies, industries, and jobs of the future, we do need everybody on the team. And it's, of course, the right thing to do. Um, so Support for, for science and technology comes in large part from the federal government. And in a de democracy, public resources should just be open to and benefit all America. So without full participation across all of America, we can't solve the most pressing issues of our time. Uh, in particular though, today I'd really like to talk to you about one particular program that OSTP is leading called the Time Is Now Advancing Equity in Science and Technology Initiative or TIN for short, which I will never say, uh, but it's how I think about it in my head. Um, so this initiative is to identify, develop, support, and amplify evidence-based policy interventions that can advance equity in science and technology for all of America. Um, it began in July of this year, and it started with a five-part roundtable series of robust conversations with experts and thought leaders, college presidents, uh, community advocates, um, and is now in our ideation challenge phase, which I hear you know a lot about um, and are even doing a hackathon on, so I can't wait to hear more about that. Um, so the idea is to solicit a broader array of input from the American public. This is the idea of you know, what science and society and what a science and society division could do. Um, these engagements will then inform OSTP action plans um, to advance equity in our science and technology ecosystem. Um, so I know Carlos and his team have made sure you've gotten all the links. And if you want to see all the roundtable press releases and such, all of those are available and we're happy to talk more about them. Um, so this ideation challenge is OSCP affirming what it looks like to build um, public comment into the process of policymaking. So if you've seen the challenge, you'll know that the um, OSTP Director Lander is asking the American public to share their insights really just on one key question. <laughs> How do we guarantee all Americans can fully, all of America, my apologies, can fully participate in and contribute to science and technology? Simple question, tough answer. We've got an hour and a half here to talk about it. Uh, and many people have been working for years um, on this question. So simply stated, tough to do, um, but we're really um, up for the challenge. So this um, challenge gives people from students, skilled technical workers, scientists, uh, tech giants, industry innovators, equity advocates, creatives, education leaders, um, and people who just value and use science in their everyday lives, the opportunity to help answer this question. 
Um, I, I'll stop uh, here because I want to be mindful of the time and all that we're doing. But I just want to say, as we um, move towards the next step of the Time Is Now initiative, the goal is that in we're going to uh, analyze um, and collate all the responses that we get. Uh, so we are going to read every single one, code them, analyze them, come up with themes, um, and share out in 2022 our Time Is Now action plan, which would detail the priorities and actions the office is going to take along this along this regard. So. Uh, really excited to hear your thoughts, comments, and to listen uh, in on today's discussion. Thanks again for having us um, and, and have a great symposium. Thank you so much, Dr. Isler. And we will be adding the, um, the main site for that uh, Time Is Now Challenge so that all of our participants um, uh, can participate. There is a key deadline of this Friday, I believe, correct? There you correct. go. Correct. All right. So the time is really now, so to speak. Um, to set a bit of the national context, uh, one of our FIU students that are participating in our uh, fly-in uh, this, uh, this week, uh, and this fly-in is a, a three-day seminar uh, focused on the future of tech talent. Uh, They're visiting key agencies, uh, congressional offices, corporate offices, et cetera. Uh, let me introduce uh, Tamara Shore. Uh, she is a senior dual degree, uh, international relations and biology, uh, unique, uh, nice mix, because she is focused on diversity in uh, tech so that advancement in the field can contribute to global humanitarian efforts. Also a bit of good news, uh, thanks to our partners that are logged on as well, the Blockchain Association. Uh, Tamara will be interning uh, with the Blockchain Association uh, in the spring. So Tamara. Hello, thank you for the intro. Yes, I'm so excited to be here. Um, and I'm so excited to be interning with blockchain and especially to be a part of this amazing cause that we definitely need in the tech industry. So I'm just gonna give a brief review of the HBR article and the reason why we're all here, of course. So this article fo focuses on the cause that in order to diversify tech, we need to follow talent. And I think that's, that's like, it's so smart, you know, and, and why has this not been done before? Anyway, this, I'm not gonna go into the statistics of like Google, Amazon, and Apple to um, prove how undiverse the tech industry is because I know if we're all here, then we all believe that that's the case. Um, but it, it basically says that the 75% of funding that tech goes to tech is, is clustered in three states, which are New York, Massachusetts, and California, and then, nobody else like these three states are the main thing and so this article uh, considers two measures which are the like the the measure of um, digital read readiness and then unrepresented pipeline of tech so it says it's the um it's the tech talent diversity basically measure and so we see in this chart how they use everybody can see the chart right okay so it's a measure of like the digital readiness and the tech talent diversity scores. And we see a good cluster of them in six states that we could potentially put our funding in to establish this diverse and talented future tech force. And these are the states of Georgia, uh, Texas, Delaware, Virginia, Connecticut, Maryland, and Florida. And so it basically says having that bias not be like the, the area not be concentrated in one and then also uses the pandemic as a turning force to have these recruit from different areas but also not have it centered in one area so not being in the bay area spreading out different places and then recruiting inwards and having them work from home and be prepared to to work from home thank you wonderful tamara not only did you lay uh put out the context, national context, but you uh, layered in a nice vision for the future. And I went ahead and dropped in the chat the study that uh, Tamara was uh, referencing um, out of Harvard. So uh, I guess that prompts the first, uh, and with uh, um, uh, credit to the authors of that study, we titled this session, Following the Talent. Uh, I guess the first question for the full audience is, uh, feel free to add this in the chat, how should the tech industry leaders follow the talent that is out there in the country? So if you have some thoughts on that, uh, we'd love that there. Uh, to kick off our first panel, uh, we're excited to introduce uh, four uh, very active, amazing individuals uh, that, have, that are uh, grappling with the same very question in different ways. Uh, let me just run through their quick uh, one-liner intros. 
uh, uh, representing STEM Connector, our amazing partner. Uh, Cindy Zikares is the head of research for STEM Connector uh, and a, also a STEM Education Research Fellow at California State University at Monterey Bay. Uh, she's also leading a National Science Foundation Includes project that focuses on uh, increasing the representation of minorities in engineering. Uh, Cindy has graciously uh, agreed to uh, moderate our uh, first panel. Murdochi Taylor LaFrance is on the government affairs team at Verizon uh, and also leads Verizon's community engagement in South Florida, a native Miamian of Haitian descent, and of course, a proud uh, alumna of Florida International University. Uh, Mark Finlayson uh, is an eminent scholar and chair associate professor of computer science uh, at our Knight Foundation School of Computing and Information Sciences. And Sunji Janga is the director of pipeline programs at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County with primary, uh, primary workforce uh, work focus on STEM pro programming. So Cindy and team, please take it away. Thank you so much, Carlos. It is an honor to be here today. I'm Cindy Zeicher, as um, Carlos mentioned, and I am very honored to be able to participate with this very astounding panel. So I'm gonna start with the questions. You can all get an A, there's, there's no risk here. The first one is in regard to the comments previously, as we re-envision and try to advance the, the future of equity in tech, what are your thoughts on how this responsibility should be shared amongst universities and in the corporate sector? And at the same time, can you tell us the strategies that your organization uses? And I'm going to start with Madoshi because we had a pre-call this week, and I know she has a lot to share. Thank you so much, Cindy. And to Carlos and the FIU and DC team, thank you so much for having me. It's just really an honor and a pleasure to be here. So I guess I'll, I'll you know, start right in here. Um, in terms of how the responsibilities should be shared amongst universities, um, I can tell you that particularly with Verizon, um, we have two specific programs that I really wanna highlight in terms of how we partner with universities. So the first I wanna talk about is generation. So one of the things that we've done over the past year is launch something that we call Citizen Verizon. So what is it? It's our responsible business plan for economic, environmental, and social advancement. And simultaneous with that announcement, we also said that we would be committed and uh, you know, really, really just excited to prepare about 500,000 individuals for jobs of the future by 2030. It's a huge task, right? So how do you do this? What we decided to do was to partner with an organization called Generation. And what they do is that they tackle global youth unemployment. They employ evidence-based approaches in terms of skill work training, and they utilize an employer first approach. So what we did was we partnered with and are still partnering with multiple colleges and universities across the entire nation. Um, it's a huge task. But that's why my colleagues and I across the country are being leveraged to connect generation to organizations and universities and institutions that are already doing this work. And I will say that I'm proud um, that we've had conversations with FIU um, and Dr. Elizabeth Behar. So certainly want to acknowledge her and her tremendous work on this issue. So what we're doing in terms of the curriculum is that we're employing technical and professional training for these students and we're focused on aiding vulnerable populations and those facing systemic challenges. We also, through the program, are giving priority access and admission to Black and Latinx applicants, women, and those who do not have a four-year degree. So what we're doing through the program is not necessarily focusing on the students who are matriculating at a university um, you know, to get a, a two-year or four-year degree. We are focused specifically on the unemployed, the underemployed, as well as those who are faced, facing job displacement or were faced with job displacement due to COVID. When I, I'll I acknowledge or, or highlight a second program, which is our 4-H Tech Changemaker program, which is really, really exciting. And so what we're doing through 4-H uh, Tech Changemaker is deepening our commitment to help rural communities by bridging the digital divide. So what does that look like? So we're working with nine HBCUs, that's right, historically black colleges and universities, all land grant institutions, 
And what the program does is it credentials teens and communities to provide training. That's And we're expecting to empower about 15,000 adults with basic digital skills needed for jobs, education, banking, healthcare, you name it, we've thought of it. And so we're working with about 23, I believe, land grant institutions, 11 of which are HBCUs, and I'll, I'll name them. We're working with Alabama A&M, Alcorn State, North Carolina A&T, FAMU, uh, Southern University, Tennessee State, and I believe Tuskegee, if I'm not mistaken. So those are the ways, you know, in particular, Cindy, um, when you talk about the shared responsibility and how we're working, um, the corporate sectors working with universities, those are just two of the ways that I wanted to highlight in terms of how we're working. Thank you. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. And I really enjoyed hearing about the emphasis on community and building the community. That's and right. with that on my screen, I'm gonna just rotate to Sunji with the same question and I'm gonna repeat it for you. What are your thoughts on how this responsibility should be shared amongst university and the universities and the corporate sector? And at the same time, please tell us about some of your strategies at your organization. Thank you, Cindy, and thank you, Carlos, and the team at FIU and Sim Connector right, for inviting us to participate and be involved. It's a great honor, and I, I liked a lot of what Murdachi said, and I don't hope I pronounce it correctly, but it, it really is about partnership. And so I, I my portfolio programs are all STEM-based, and it started pre-college and go all the way through graduate students, and focused on uh, first-generation low-income students at the high school level through Upper Bound Math Science, which is a, a Department of Education funded TRIO program, all the way through a real focus on underrepresented minority students through NSF funded programs for undergraduates and graduate students. Uh, and, and that portfolio really reveals that we there's a real requirement to focus on a skill set and mindset uh, and the skill set and mindset required to be successful in the STEM workforce. Right, if you think about Common Core, as many people that didn't like it, it was a really interesting idea fundamentally to say, what do we need workers to be able to do? And how do we need workers to be able to think? And let's work backwards to say where they need to be as they develop and evolve to get to that when they're finished. And so it's the same principle for students coming out of undergraduate. Right? As you graduate from college, there are things you need to be able to do in these kind of 21st century skills that are very, very different Right, than what was required when I graduated from college 25 years ago. I know I don't look like it, but it, is, it has been that long. I went to North Carolina a and as my beloved alma mater, so shout out to the Aggies. And, and it's a completely different world, right? I have a, a daughter who just graduated from Howard and the world she's walking into is completely different from the world I walked into as a college graduate. And so it's important that the people who drive decision-making, right? who are my age and older recognize that the, we're creating students to operate in a space that's foreign even to us. And so the other big part of that is really kind of thinking about how we integrate real world into that curriculum. So at UNBC, we do a lot of work with our corporate partners and, and they're primarily around us. So Northrop Grumman is the example I'll give because that's the biggest partner because they're right up the street, right? And so, we work very closely with Northrop Grumman to integrate real world problems and challenges into our classroom. And it's not just in a typical way of for a capstone design project, right? Or a design challenge. It's also having technical staff from Northrop Grumman come and talk to students about the things they do every day. One of the challenges that we found is that students don't necessarily know what being a practicing member of the STEM workforce looks like. Because internships are great, but it's just kind of a sneak peek it doesn't really tell you how much you're doing because somebody's telling you what to do every day, right? And then you go do it. And then at the end of it, you're like, yeah, I had a great experience. Well, what I learned from engineering, because my background was in mechanical engineering, is that the most important thing that engineering taught me is how to solve problems, complex problems that are loosely defined, right? And I've used that throughout my career in all kinds of ways. So thinking about how we focus in on what they need to be able to do when they finish has become critically important. The last point before I stop talking, because I'll talk for a long time if you let me, is we have to be really, really collaborative in how we're defining equity and diversity, equity, and inclusion from both a corporate perspective and from a university perspective in terms of training so that we have a clear sense of the value proposition. Right? We do lots of research 
and, and what it means to have a diverse workforce, why there's a benefit, but it's still unclear to lots of people what the ROI on DEI really is. And that's not just for corporate partners and higher ed administrators and faculty, but as importantly for students. And so that's where I'll close, but um, I'm happy to talk about more if you'd like. Thank you so much, Sunji. That was very exciting. And especially your comments about partnership and collaboration around equity. I really appreciate those points. And I now turn to Dr. Finlayson, Finlayson I hope I'm saying that right, Mark, um, for your comments. And I'll repeat the question for your sake. What are your thoughts on how this responsibility should be shared amongst universities and the corporate sector? And at the same time, please tell us some of your strategies at your institution. Uh, right, so <clears throat> um, I think one thing that struck me just listening to um, uh, Sunji here at uh, UMBC, it sounds like he's having a very similar experience to us where we have a variety of corporate partners and you know we're working on, on these sorts of things. But what strikes me is that this problem of, of diversity, lack of diversity in the tech field is, is a systemic problem, which is, is resulting a, a result of very deep structural factors in the culture and the construction, the, the, the setup of the system <clears throat> in the nation. And so in that sense, like a systemic problem like this really needs a systemic um, solution. And I think the thing that we're not doing as a nation is we're, we don't have a systemic approach. Uh, we don't have an integrated approach. We have a lot of piecemeal approaches. So uh, a couple of months doesn't go by when some company doesn't approach us saying, hey, we want to hire more uh, Hispanics. So let's, you know, let's do something. And I'm the associate director of the school and we, we run out of time to, to, you know, it's not scalable, right? You can't, you can't interact with every individual company that comes to you wanting to hire um, Hispanic students. What we need is an approach that, that will scale to the system level uh, that we have right now. And, and, all, and the, that's the other thing, the universities are not very well connected. Like we are a part of this Cashy in, um, Alliance, for example, which is like, I think 40 uh, HSIs and H HCBUs. Um, so that's a, that's, a, that's a good example of like a larger effort but a lot of these other efforts are just, you know, the diversity officer at the company at some company says, oh, well, we need to hire some more diverse people. Let's go to FIU. Well, you know, 1,000 other companies have that same idea. And so that that's, I don't see that as something which is really going to move the needle in the long term. Like it, it's good for corporate PR to some degrees, um, but I think um, we need a more national integrated systemic approach uh, to this. So I think the thing, I would like to see is universities and, and corporations collaborating together to figure out what that looks like. And that probably also needs, you know, guidance from the, the government, right, to, to make that happen. Thank you so much, Mark. And I'm excited to hear about your involvement with the CASI Alliance, which is an NSF includes initiative. And it's, I think it's the, right. mm -hmm. the most um, historic alliance because it had funding even prior to the NSF oh. includes initiative. But can you tell us a little bit more about how you engage with the NSF Includes initiative? Right. Well, so I, I personally am, a, am a, a newcomer to that initiative. So there's another, there's a co-PI um, over in electrical engineering. Um, oh, shoot. I'm, I'm blanking on the name. But the, in any case, uh, so basically we're involved now at, on the computer science side um, at the undergraduate level. We, there's something called the Google Tech Exchange. And this is actually a really good example of, of a program which, which demonstrates sort of the, num the amount of resources that you really have to uh, devote to this to actually do something useful. Because I think, you know, this problem has been on everybody's radar for about 15 years now. And what we're seeing is that we haven't made much of a difference, right? So NSF has been hammering on this for a decade and a half. You had to include, you know, things about diversity and broadening participation and so forth in your NSF proposals, which is, you know, $40 billion a year of funding for uh, since the mid 2000s. And, you know, reading this Harvard Business Review, you know, we're not really much further along than we were back then. Um, so, so I think that, you know, the lesson learned there is there's no easy band-aid, right? And it really requires a lot of resources. So if you look at the Google Tech Exchange, I mean, they're putting, I want to say they're putting like a million dollars a year into this and maybe they're getting, I don't know, a hundred um, diverse interns uh, per year out of it. 
So, so if you just, you know, do the math, you know, that's, that's quite a, it's $10,000 investment to, to recruit one, um, one diverse uh, uh, potential, potential employee. So I think that, that kind of is, a, is like a back the envelope um, indication of what the resources that industry will need to commit if they really want to move the needle on this. Fantastic. Thank you for that in insight. That's really eye-opening for me. Um, and now I'm going to move back to Madoshi for our next question. I appreciate all your comments. It's very inspiring to me. So here we go, um, Madoshi. The second question is, are there other supports that are needed that we have not mentioned that are essential when making sure diverse communities are connected to the jobs in the tech sector? Um, I will say absolutely. So I know particularly at Verizon, we have this uh, really incredible saying, right, Cindy? So what we, said, what we say at Verizon is that we create the networks that move the world forward. So if you think about a network, right, it's, it's defined as like a group or a system of interconnected people or things. And in our case, what that means is that Verizon is playing a very active role to move who we consider our fourth stakeholder, and that would be society, forward, right? So we're meeting the moment so that we can meet the need. For the sake of this conversation, we're doing a lot along a continuum, right? Um, and so I'll highlight our Verizon Innovative Learning, and I'm going to use that as an umbrella to talk about several programs. So the first is school, schools in need. So we're working, Verizon is working with Digital Promise, um, students and teachers in under-resourced middle schools and high schools across the country. And what happens through our cohorts is that they receive free devices, which includes hotspots um, for those who don't have reliable home internet access. They receive free data um, and as well as innovative technology drive and curriculum. For the teachers, so we're, we're not just equipping the students, but also for the teachers, they're receiving professional development and those in the participating schools also receive comprehensive training so that they can prepare those same students in their classrooms for success in what we're calling the digital economy. I'll pivot now to programs that were uh, two other programs called the Young Men of Color, as well as our Rural Young Women's Program. So in partnership with HBCUs, with HSIs like FIU and rural colleges, we're teaching STEM and entrepreneurial skills to underserved middle school students. So the program includes a tech immersion summer camp. Um, it's hosted on college campuses, uh, followed by monthly after school sessions and mentoring throughout the school year. So students learn skills in coding, they learn skills in 3D design and printing and augmented virtual reality. And I, I'll say this, I'm proud that Verizon um, has actually supported the after school all-stars at FIU, which um, is led by uh, Sean Prosper. So kudos to Sean and FIU um, and the FIU after school all-stars because we were able to support them in that endeavor uh, for the past couple of summers. Now I wanna talk about our Innovation 5G Lab. So we're inspiring students with tech and innovation and building state-of-the-art experiential learning spaces um, within schools, those same Verizon Innovative Learning Schools that I discussed. And we're also powering select labs with Verizon's 5G technology, which is really, I mean, just absolutely incredible. The fact that students will have access to the technology means that students and teachers and professionals alike can actually innovate, right? Uh, as we enter and go through this digital economy, even through the pandemic. And then of course, the labs offer students access to emerging technologies, as I stated, in terms of AR, VR, as well as AI. And then lastly, which is really important, not only are we equipping students, but we're equipping anyone in the education space with tools uh, through our Verizon Innovative uh, Learning HQ, so our headquarters. So to help ensure that no child is left behind, we created a free next generation online portal, which is geared geared towards uh, K through 12. So you don't have to be a Verizon Innovative Learning School or designated a VILS to have access to VILS HQ. So the portal, which is open to anyone, is designed to help educators bring immersive learning tools, including AR and VR technologies into their lesson plans. The free education portal includes curated content from Columbia University, NYU, Arizona State University, and other academic institutions 
um, covering a broad range of subjects from history to biology um, and anything that the mind can conceive. And so these professional development courses are aligned to research backed uh, micro credentials, which are available to educators throughout the portal. So again, you don't have to be a teacher at a Verizon Innovative Learning School to have access to our Verizon Innovative Learning HQ. And for any and everyone that's watching or will watch since this is being recorded, it's available at verizon.com forward slash learning. So those are just some of the ways, um, I know I said a lot there, Cindy, but just some of the ways that we're ensuring that diverse communities are connected to jobs in the tech sector. Fantastic. And um, Madoshi, I really congratulate Verizon to taking the lead in supporting the K-12 pipeline into STEM careers. Um, and as Sunji said earlier, it is a different world. I wish when I was a middle school student, I had access to 3D printing and training in AI and especially the AR and VR tools that Verizon is supporting our middle school students with. And I also would like to give a shout out to Digital Promise for being a great example of developing a network and a collaboration with a corporation like Verizon. So thank you for those comments. And now I'll give our second question to Sunji so he has an opportunity to share what you think are the other supports that are needed and that we have not already mentioned that are essential when making sure diverse communities are connected to jobs in the tech sector. So thank you, Cindy. We kind of have, right? And I really like what Mark just said around the systemic nature of the problem and, and thus the required systemic nature of the solution. It also goes to what Madocha just said around access, 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 access. I cannot say enough that you cannot get more juice from the same orange, right? At some point, you just reach the limit to the amount of juice you can squeeze out of it. It's just true. See, if you want more juice, you need more oranges, right? And so one of the things that we are really focused on is not just providing access, but providing it early. And so um, we do a lot with FIRST Robotics, for example. We're a regional center for FIRST Robotics. That's a great example of how when you expose younger students, and I'm not talking about high school, I'm talking about pre-K, K through five, middle school, all the way up. When you expose them to STEM, right? And then engage them in STEM, you can excite them about STEM. And now all of a sudden you have students who are thinking about, oh, I wanna do that from very early. I knew I wanted to be an engineer because I like to break stuff and fix it, right? But everybody doesn't think about that. It doesn't seem like it's available. It doesn't seem possible. And so part of it, is about making sure that we get students just excited about STEM as a pathway out of whatever they're trying to evolve from as they are about entertainment and athletics, right? They'll dribble a ball. I have, I have students that will dribble a ball in the middle of the night with no lights in the cold because that's their pathway out. But it's a really long shot where this is a really safe bet, right? If you do the work and you really work hard you can do this and do it for a lifetime. We make the point to our students that the difference, the difference between a career long earnings with a college degree and none is about a million dollars over your lifetime. And they're astounded by that, so are their parents. But as we're talking to them, we show them that this is the direction that the workforce is going in. This is where the jobs will be. This is where the highest paid jobs will be. This is where you can go and change the trajectory of your family. Right? And so making that case of why this is really, really important, readily available, and most importantly, possible for you as a student, that's the lane I think that we really need to kind of shift the focus on. And it's gonna take everyone to do that. It's not just up to the K through 12 educators. It's not just up to the universities and colleges. It's not just up to the corporations. All have to kind of work together along with government agencies, nonprofits, et cetera, to help kids, who don't typically have access, the oranges we don't see, also participate. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much. And I think your point is very well taken that developing a STEM identity early is critical before those ideas of I'm not able to enjoy STEM or engage in STEM and I haven't gotten coursework needed to be qualified in STEM um, takes place. And that can be as early as um, the first year of high school you need those courses and you need to have some kind of STEM identity to set goals for the future. So thank you for that point. And with that, I turn to Mark with the same question. I know you did have concerns about 
a need for systemic change. So are there other supports that are needed that we have not mentioned that are essential when making sure diverse communities are connected to jobs in the tech sector? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I had two things on my list and the K through 12 one was number one. So that's, you know, you, once you've gotten to the university, it's you're, you're already behind the eight ball, right? Because so many people have fallen out of the, the pipeline at that point. Um, so I won't hammer on that point, but I'm completely in agreement with that. Um, and in fact, I would say you, you had mentioned first year of high school, Cindy, um, you know, studies that I've read indicate that that identity about STEM or non-STEM as actually forming in the first year of middle, middle school, right? So as early as fifth grade, students are already deciding that that's not for them, right? So that's, that's, a, that's a critical problem. Um, so let me, the, the second thing I had on my list was, um, you know, I think universities are doing, uh, are doing a lot. Um, it's piecemeal. We need to be more systemic and intentional about it. Corporations are starting to, to do quite a bit. Um, you know, they're picking up, starting to pick up pace. Uh, I think one thing that corporations can do better is there has been a, a, a significant trend in the past 10 to 20 years of pushing corporate training back onto the universities. Right. So saying, well, we need um, we, we're not just we're not satisfied anymore that the students have the basics and know the theory and, you know, they, they know how to you know solve problems and this sort of thing. They need to have these specific technology skills. They need to know these specific frameworks, these these things. It's, it's becoming very, very intense. And and that is to some degree a profit seeking, you know, that's a profit driven thing. Right. Because it costs money to train people. So if you can get someone else to do it for you, that's money you can, <laughs> you know, that's profit, right? That you can use to send back to your shareholders or whatever you do with it. So I think, but that's one of the big problems that we see is because the, the preparation gap between, you know, mainstream and majority students who come from well-resourced uh, educational backgrounds and minority students is ever widening because of that, right? So not only do they not have the, the bandwidth themselves, to pick up these additional things. Oftentimes their institutions are also behind the curve. I mean, we, we at FIU, we're a pretty big school. Well, we're, we're a very, very big school and we're still struggling to keep up with you know, the, the rapid pace of technological development, which means that our students aren't necessarily walking out the door with you know, the latest uh, training and the latest gizmos, right? Or latest framework or whatever. And so I think corporate America has sort of dropped the ball on you know, making a commitment to, okay, you're gonna take them this far and we, they're not gonna be immediately ready to walk into, you know, they're not gonna be you know, supporting your customers on day one, there's gotta be training. And, and I think that's, that's something that we need to push back on. I think, corp and that's especially true for diverse, diversity candidates, right? Where there needs to be more of a commitment that, yeah, there's gonna be an investment up front where we're going to bring in someone, maybe on paper, you know, they don't they don't quite reach that level that we're looking for, right? So they're like, oh, we want someone with X, Y, and Z, and blah blah blah, and all this sort of stuff. And that's where a lot of diverse candidates get dinged, right? They're like, oh, well, you don't look like our standard candidate because you don't have all these skills which require all these resources to require. Therefore, you, sorry, you're out of luck. There needs to be more of a commitment on the corporate side to um, to, to, uh, actually take on some of that training. That's my personal thing. I don't know, maybe Mergochi has a, has a different uh, opinion, perhaps. <laughs> I think that's a very important point, um, that it, it might be a mutual responsibility, um, that corporations and institutions of higher ed and all the way down through the pipeline really prepare teachers and faculty for industry job training so that it doesn't all fall on industry. And likewise, as I think, um, Sunji mentioned, the industries come into the classroom and really start participating with how to train um, potential candidates. Um, thank you so much for those comments. I just want to clarify what I what I'm actually talking about. I mean, all that's great what you talked what you said, but it's actually more about once they're in the job, training them with the things that they need. Right. Once they're now being paid and employed by the corporation, there is still there should be still quite a bit of training that is being done by the corporations. And that's a cost, right? That's a cost. Like definitely. this, this is not, not something that it's a, it's an easy bandaid. Right? Most definitely. And thank you for reiterating that. And I'm being told that our time is getting short and that we have some um, individuals who are ready to ask questions. Um, specifically, I think Dean Darko has a question. Um, and I don't know if we're going to unmic Dean Darko for him to answer a question or her. 
I'm not sure if the question Hi. is in the chat. Oh, there you are. Hi. There you go. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, greetings from the only amazing uh, HBCU in the entire universe, Florida Memorial University. Uh, my question is very simple. I believe uh, it is being touched upon. Uh, I hear about uh, all the possible collaborations, all the possible access opportunities. Is there the possibility to create a clearinghouse, uh, sort of a, a common area where we can all gather to share our challenges and then also have a common place to share and utilize resources. Who would like to answer that question? You can unmic or I can call on you. I, I guess I'll go first, Cindy. Um, for the Dean Darko, first of all, thank you so much. I got really excited when I saw you get on because if you heard me earlier talk about generation um, in our partnership to sort of equip global youth with digital skills, we actually have a partner, uh, a partnership with Florida Memorial University. Um, you all are our second HBCU in the nation to have uh, this partnership where we are equipping your students with technical skills. So whether it's, you know, for IT, whether it's learning coding or whatever it is, and I would love to connect with you offline um, to discuss the partnership further. Um, I completely agree with you. I think um, just addressing, you know, some comments that, that Mark said, you know, particularly, and I can speak only for Verizon, um, because we are building America's most reliable network. Um, we do actually equip folks, uh, not just when they get in the job, but even prior. So if you heard me talk about the continuum in that pipeline, we have our Bills Innovative Learning in middle school and high school. We have um, the partnership with Generation. We have that partnership with 4-H that are not just equipping adults with, with basic liter uh, literacy, digital literacy skills, but also the teens, right? We're credentialing them so that they're equipped. Um, one of the other, you know, the last questions, um, and I was hoping to get to it, Cindy, but we didn't have an opportunity to, um, was to talk about even uh, post, uh, uh, you know, graduation, we have an internship called Ad Fellows. And one of the things I think that struck me that Sunji said was, you know, we need to actually activate that interest in STEM very early. And so even when you activate that interest in STEM, I think a lot of people just think in it in very technical terms. But if you can imagine, there are also quite a bit of functions that happen even at Verizon. So what Ad Fellows does is it's an, a, an intensive fellowship or um, internship opportunity where we take students from around the country and they rotate, not just at Verizon, but at other fortune companies across the nation. So um, Dr. You know, Dean Darko, I completely agree with you in terms of the clearinghouse. I think maybe they can, there can be more of a convening, um, not just with high institutions of higher learning, but even corporates. And I think that's what this conversation is really about. Oh, and I'll be brief. The answer, of course, is yes, right? But this is a conversation we've been having for probably 30 years. I remember in the 90s being in rooms where we talked about creating this clearinghouse and a database. And so um, there are organizations like NACME and the National Action Council for Minorities Engineering, AAAS that, that are charged with this, that have, that have tried to do this. But I, I think we're at a unique point now, explicitly around this, where technology provides opportunities that weren't necessarily there before. Thank you so much. And we have just one or two minutes left. I have one question pending here from Carla Diaz. And I think we'd like to spotlight her and allow Carla to ask her question before we close out. Oh, yes, I will ask the question again. Uh, from a minority student perspective, most of the time we're unaware of opportunities that are available to us uh, because we're new to this technology workforce spaces. Uh, how do we make sure we know of the resources and opportunities that are available to us, such as internships and apprenticeships that stem from the collaborative effort between universities and corporations? Uh, so <laughs> I don't have a good answer for you. And this is where a clearinghouse would be really helpful, right? Um, and is the White House still on the line? I think they need to be a part of that conversation. But in any case, the um, I, I think that there's there's usually always career uh, services you, you can go to. Uh, you, we are you at FIU? Um, I'm sorry, no, I am but, at uh, University of Illinois. So I encourage you to just 
Um, you know, sometimes people don't know exactly who to talk to, and then so they don't talk to anyone. So I would encourage you just to go and, you know, ask everybody you can think of in who's in a position of authority in your in your department, who you should talk to, and then you'll probably get a lot of uh, good connections that way. I'll just add to that as we close out that at Cal State Monterey Bay, for example, we have the Undergraduate Research Opportunity Center that I'm a part of. And that center offers so many opportunities for scholarships, internships, apprenticeships, and long-term planning for careers in STEM. Um, so I hope that helps. Carla, I'm sorry that we don't have time for any more questions. I believe we've run out of questions. And so I think if, Carlos, am I right? We need to move yeah. to our next. Um, so, yeah, I think we uh, have uh, time for one more question. I believe one of our FIU students, uh, Kaylee. Uh, yes. Okay, thank you for the extra time. Thank you for the extra time. And Kaylee LaChapelle, would you like to ask your question? And we'll unmute you for that purpose. Hi. So my name is Kaylee LaChapelle. I'm a first year at FIU studying IR and poli sci. Um, and uh, part of this flying experience is we get to work on a policy hack for the White House. Um, and so our entire um, thing is going off of pretty much like a few months ago, Biden signed an executive order on diversity, equity, inclusion and uh, in the federal workforce. And we're kind of going off of the, these, these standards and guidelines that were set. Um, and we have ideas of making a federal agency that would be um, that very implemented that to support minority development and um, to help with DEIA accessibility within the workforce. My question is really narrowing down on policy within the federal government. And we had a lot of talk on academic institutions with corporations and that partnership that can like uh, foster like solutions to the, the, the gap that's in the divert in the gap of diversity in the technology sector. Do the panelists believe that implementing legislation within our federal government to enforce what everything talking about from diversifying the hiring process to making resources more available to removing barriers within federal legislation would make more would make an impact to so corporations academic institutions and government officials can actually enforce it because i i remember mark saying that this is about 15 years of this uh that legislation has been building on and it's very very it's lacking out there so i just wanted to hear the panelists thoughts um because it goes right in hand with our policy hack proposal okay um, Madoshi, I'll ask if you would like to take that, or um, Sundi, who would like to answer that question? Sorry, I was having some challenges unmuting, um, so I apologize. And I don't know if you all saw the chat, but just related to the last question um, for the young lady who asked about how she can find information regarding uh, internships and fellowships, there is a resource called Handshake. Um, and I placed the link in the chat, so feel free to click on that because a lot of corporations, and I think Dr. Finlinson just pointed out that FIU is also on Handshake. So please feel free to, um, to join that. Regarding the question, um, the present question, I would say this, legislating anything is fantastic, right? But it's the execution that oftentimes is lacking. I will tell you that particularly at Verizon, I am incredibly proud of our corporation because we have intentionally, intentionally made a decision from our president and CEO down um, that we're going to prioritize diversity. We're going to prioritize DEI and not just DEI, but also what's also lacking a lot of times is that belonging piece, right? Um, it's easy for corporations to hire diverse candidates, but are you creating a, a, a culture and an environment, quite frankly, that allows them to feel a sense of belonging? So I, I th for me, I think um, legislating anything um, is fantastic, right? Because it sets, I think, a standard for how we move forward. But I also think it's the true north of the company, the true north of the university, the true north of the organization that has to prioritize it in order for it to be realized or actualized. And Sunji or Mark, would you like to comment? Yeah. Um, so. I appreciate the question about regulation. Um, the so my view, as I've been mentioning or hammering on, you know, recruiting, training, um, retaining uh, diverse candidates costs money. So that means that companies that focus on that are at a disadvantage to companies who don't. Um, that until whatever 
long-term benefits that come out of higher, having a diverse workforce sort of uh, you know, make themselves uh, known. So that suggests to me that a regulatory approach to redress that imbalance between costs makes a lot of sense. Now, the devil is in the details. How do you design that you know, in such a way that you're going to uh, you know, really make it work rather than have it be some sort of draconian thing that you know, everybody hates and, and doesn't really get the job done? That's, that's the trick. So I, I, I think the short answer is, I think regulation is a great uh, thing to do, to do and, but we have to be very careful about uh, designing it and making sure it's done correctly. Thank you, Mark. And to close us out, Sunji, did you have a comment on this? I'm not sure if Sunji can unmute. Okay. Ah, not allowing me to. Sunji, we can hear you. Okay, so I, I think the points that were made were exactly right. It's a, it, regulation and legislation is a great lever, but it's just a lever. Um, what what it has to the hope is that 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 will facilitate is not just a culture shift, but also a philosophical shift that diverse doesn't equal deficient or defective. Right? It's just in most cases disadvantaged, and that's true from K through twelve all the way through um, minority serving institutions, and so. That'd be a great lever, but it can't be the only thing. We can't expect just the federal government to be the entity that's solely responsible for ensuring that we diversify our workforce. Thank you so much. And with that, I'm going to close this panel and thank them so much for their insightful comments and for participating with us today. I'm gonna to turn it back over to Carlos for the rest of our exciting panels and discussion. So thank you everyone. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you, uh, Mark, Sunji, Mardochi. Um, that uh, math uh, on behalf of, uh, I believe Mark mentioned the uh, math as it relates to Google um, and DEI and uh, recruitment efforts, just uh, so that the full audience is aware. Uh, our group of uh, FIU students here in Washington will be meeting with uh, Google's policy shop a little bit later today. So thank you for priming that. Sunji, uh, I heard your reference to oranges. I'm sure oranges are also grown in Maryland but there's this lovely state called Florida. We have them in great abundance. So a little state, uh, state by state uh, competition there. Uh, we're next honored uh, to have with us uh, uh, Dr. Francis Cologne, uh, just for a quick little reaction. Uh, Dr. Cologne, uh, her day job, uh, she's currently the Senior Director for in International Climate Policy at uh, the Center for American Progress. Uh, as a result of that, you could imagine that she was not uh, on the Eastern Seaboard uh, for the last two weeks. She's been uh, quite busy uh, as part of COP26. But uh, for the purpose of today, uh, Dr. Colon uh, is proud to be a member of the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. Uh, she is a neuroscientist and previously, uh, and on behalf of FIU, we thank her because we've, uh, we've been uh, interacting with her since her days in the Obama administration where she was a uh, Deputy Science and Technology Advisor uh, at the uh, for the U.S. Secretary of State. So, Dr. Cologne, we are curious, uh, based on what you've been hearing uh, in your new role at PCAST, are there any uh, takeaways that are striking you as to uh, issues that uh, you know uh, either through your role at PCAST or just in the general community uh, we should be uh, that uh, that is striking you? Thank you, Carlos, and thank you, FIU, for putting this together. Can everybody hear me? Just checking. Yes? Okay, perfect. Um, so thank you to all the panelists, Cindy, and everybody for, for the comments. Uh, very insightful into what the challenge that we still have in front of us is in terms of diversity in STEM. I think uh, from my perspective on PCAST, serving for, for Biden's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, um, he asked us two very clear questions um, out of five that pertain to our discussion today. Um, one was, how can the United States ensure that it is a world leader in technologies and industries of the future that will be critical to our economic prosperity and national security? 
And another one was how can we guarantee that the fruits of science and technology are fully shared across America and among all Americans? And I think those are very relevant to the discussion we just had. Um, our, our group of, of scientists and technology experts on PCAS is going to be diving into the five questions, including the two I just highlighted um, during our time uh, serving for the president in this capacity. Um, listening, just like you have done, um, sort of on, on listening tours, um, listening to to communities, listening to the private sector, listening to experts, uh, to make recommendations on how we can um, go further faster in, in this regard. Um, just a few reactions. I think uh, the panelists really hit the nail on the head when they talked about um, and, and your student that highlighted the Harvard uh, study at the beginning, um, there's a disparity in terms of resources put into regions and institutions in specific regions in the country. And this is something that PCAS is very aware of and something we've already started to talk about. So I wanna give props to you, Carlos, and your team for highlighting that because it is such an important aspect of how we tackle this challenge is to be aware of how resources are being disproportionately allocated across the country and what that does to access. Um, second, I, I thought that the uh, issue of systemic, um, um, of, of issues that are systemic to, to access and to diversity are, are still very much a part of, of, of what we have to tackle. And we have to to name things um, and be not afraid to name things. Um, and so I think the panel did that. I think we could do it a lot more. Um, there, there is a resource challenge at institutions, um, but there's also a bias challenge at institutions, whether it's private sector and so forth. And, and we need to be able to, to confront those and face those as we are doing the work. Um, the STEM identity, developing that as early as possible and having our K through 12 be a part of how we solve this challenge is certainly important. Um, but like Sunji said, we've been having this conversation for so long. Um, if, if I were to count the panels I've been on talking about STEM diversity, um, I would run out of fingers and toes and, and all of it. Um, and so um, I just kind of want to drive the message that we need to take action um, now, we know when that STEM identity um, develops. We know where the biases are. We know where the resources aren't going. Um, we know um, that the private sector is putting a lot on academia in terms of pre preparing our diverse candidates. And when, they're, and when they don't click one box, that they ding them. We know all those things. Um, I would encourage us all to act, to act now, to, to just tackle some of those challenges that we know already there, um, that we probably don't need too many more reports to start tackling these challenges, um, and that we, we need to allocate the resources. I am, I am very heartened by Jedida's comments um, and what OSTP is doing with the challenge. Um, I think let's analyze what comes in from that challenge. Let's feed that to PCAS, let's feed it to OSTP, and let's get going. Let's act now um, because our students need it, our nation needs it. And this is uh, what President Biden has called on us to do. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Colon. Uh, and once again, we're, uh, we're honored to have you and Dr. Ristler, uh, both uh, you know, representing policymakers and, and organizations that are, that are looking to get it done. Um, we want to, as we switch gears to our final panel, um, uh, we did wanna ask another poll question that will be dropped in the chat now. Basically, what role do we think the audience uh, that the federal government can be playing uh, to spur along collaboration between K-12 higher ed government uh, and the corporate sector. So if you, as you're answering that, uh, I'm pleased to uh, introduce our uh, final panel really for some rapid fire. We're switching gears a little, but not, not really uh, because the same uh, substance of the earlier discussion, but what are regional approaches that may have been uh, employed already or that we're looking to employ? Uh, quick intros of this uh, final group. Hanena S. Malbeji is a clinical assistant professor uh, an associate director of undergraduate studies at the University of Illinois at Chicago, uh, who also started the Biomedical Engineering uh, Society there. Deborah Marcus is a senior director of Breakthrough Tech, uh, seasoned educator, education administrator, uh, focused on the intersection of education uh, and technology. Before Breakthrough, being at Breakthrough Tech, uh, Debbie served as the executive director of computer science education at the New York City Department of Education, where she led uh, the city's uh, wildly successful CS for All initiative. 
Francisco Sorrentino uh, is the Chief Human Resource Officer of SoftBank Group International, a uh, very important partner uh, in Miami and uh, throughout the country, and has led uh, an effort in Miami in particular to spur some collaboration amongst uh, our local universities. Uh, and might also have some, some challenging thoughts to the, to the regional question. Uh, and Raul Moas is a program director at the Knight Foundation, uh, where he's focused on promoting equitable and inclusive economic development. Raul was also very instrumental. Uh, and on behalf of FIU, we thank the Knight Foundation in the transformative investment um, uh, for our School of uh, uh, Computing Sciences. So uh, without, just to kick it off, and we really wanna do rapid fire, we'd love to hear from each one of you as to what regional solutions uh, you might already be employing to move the needle on diversifying um, more of the tech talent pipeline. And why don't we start with uh, Francisco? Well, thank you for having me, first of all. And, and I have to say, I, I cannot agree anymore with everything that the first panel has said. Um, I think this is a systemic issue and we have to take it seriously and respect it big time because it's not gonna be a sum of uh, isolated initiatives. Um, I do agree that we need more oranges um, because it's really a problem of talent scarcity that we have. And I would like to talk about, before getting into the original um, you know, solutions, um, the three converging trends that we see from SoftBank in terms of uh, the, this talent issue. One is the trend of talent scarcity that we all know has been brewing for the last 10 years. We know this moment would come and is here where we need more talent than what is available out there. The second is the talent mobility. I mean, technology has been evolving. The pandemic just accelerated that and really Today is truly possible to work to work anytime from anywhere, which is a, a second reality that we have around. And the third reality that maybe is not so obvious at this point is the effect of venture capital, which is pouring an enormous amount of capital into creating new organizations that, and these organizations, I could call them a next gen type of organizations where the mindset is very different than the mindset that the traditional organizations had. Uh, up, up to now, which actually in part contributed to the diversity issue. And this, this mindset, I think, is characterized for two things. First, it's, it's not about where you come from, but where are the problems that you can solve. The second is, it's not about your credentials, it's about your mindset. And when you think about these two conditions, you're really leveling the field. In, in, so in, in, in some regards, I would say I'm extremely optimistic in terms of the future of the problem that we are discussing today. Uh, I've never been more optimistic than today for these reasons that I mentioned. So in SoftBank, we put a lot of emphasis on solving this problem again from a systemic perspective. And again, before getting into the regional, the first thing we do is to work with our portfolio companies to really think about how we expand the talent pool. And we move them from what is obvious and what is comfortable. The second thing that we do is to help them rethink hiring. So hiring is not no longer about making safe choices because you are no longer able to do that. It's about making the difficult choices and it's about removing all the conditions that you really don't need to perform in your business. Um, the second, the third thing we do is we need to invest disproportionately in diversity. You are not gonna be able to make a difference if you keep proportionally making the investments because you're only gonna continue seeing the same problem over and over again. So. This is part of what we did when we founded the Opportunity Fund, which is we deployed $100 million to invest only on founders that are either female or founders of color in the US. Um, we have already 50 companies under this portfolio. And it's not just about the money. Most of the SoftBank team spends the proportional amount of time coaching these founders. We give them tools, we give them support to hire, to build their teams, to attract talent, uh, to solve complex problems and to take off, basically, because what we want is to build many success stories, right? The, the other thing that we're doing is we created a problem called Emerge, which is an accelerator of founders. And basically this creates an effect of, you know, giving founders the tools and the access to relationships and network that they don't have naturally because are, you know, um, basically disproportionately going to the non-diverse founders the access to these tools. And, the, and the, the fourth part, which is I think very relevant to this conversation is what we do in order to create a, a, a better synchronicity, a better coordination between a student's readiness and what the companies out there require uh, from the students. And I think working with faculty members in order to prepare students 
We work with FIU, we work with Miami uh, Dade College and uh, University of Miami in this concerted effort called the Softman Cooperator School. So we put it together, this curricula, basically take students from these institutions through what it means to work in a, in a startup, what it means to work in these growth uh, stage organizations, and how to prepare for the moment when you face this opportunity, how to make the most out of those interviews, how to really understand if this is for you or not. And the idea here is this is the first step of many in trying to get students closer to really think the way they need to think in order to be successful in this environment. And of course, our emphasis on this is around labor standards. Now, the, sorry, the last thing before, and you mentioned this, Carlos, and I don't want to be controversial, but when I hear the regional effort, and I do understand that there are some golden pockets of talent uh, across the US and really across the world that are untapped, and we should actually definitely tap into that. I think that the solution for this is to really have a global approach and mindset and go wherever the talent is around the world and, with, and around the US. So certainly, you know, secluding yourself into one particular region is just limiting your options. Right? Thank you. Uh, Debbie, breakthrough tech or from your own experience in uh, New York City? Sure, thank you, uh, FIU, so much uh, for having me today. I was reflecting on the, the conversation about systemic change and systemic inequity that we have um, in my work, both in K-12 and in higher ed, uh, that our students are in a, a series of broken systems. So not only are the systems themselves inequitable, the systems don't connect. So from a underserved student perspective, trying to make their way from K-12 into higher ed, into a job, they are navigating so many different complex systems that are not working. And so echo the, the need to fix the systems and connect the systems, um, which I think is uh, you know, crucial for changing the, the face of, of diversity in tech. Um, and I also think that uh, we have a tendency to constantly blame the, the people before us in the pipeline. So we have corporations who say, we don't have enough diverse talent or oranges. Uh, <laughs> we're talking about. Um, and then we have universities saying they're not going to get, they're not getting prepared students from uh, high school, high schools blame middle schools, middle schools blame elementary schools, and that we can't just fix pre-K to solve today's tech challenges. And so that we all have a spot in this pipeline that we can make change now while we think about fixing the larger systems. Um, so Breakthrough Tech is a uh, organization. We are housed at Cornell Tech, but we partner with large public universities around the country to get more women, particularly Black, Latina, and Native women, into studying computing and then access to tech careers. We started with a partnership in New York City with the City University of New York, um, which is a combination of 24 different uh, community and senior colleges in the city uh, university system. We were partnered, uh, we were funded originally uh, and still are by Verizon, so thankful uh, to our colleagues at Verizon who are on the call. Um, and we sit at the intersection of industry and academia to provide access to students. And we firmly believe it is not too late for students who did not have access to computing in high school or, or who had bad experiences and opted themselves out. It is not too late when they get to college to start um, becoming computer scientists. And so we have a variety of programs that help make sure that uh, women can enter computing even without prior experience. Um, and then we also have the same viewpoint about getting our women, particularly underserved women, into jobs. So we have a variety of different programs, um, but uh, one that I wanted to highlight is our Sprint Internship Program, where we've been working with companies who say we want to hire more diverse talent, and we have diverse talent uh, at universities that they don't typically recruit from. Um, and when we try to connect those students to uh, in, um, internship opportunities, they weren't even getting interviews. And so after talking to our corporate partners, realizing that the students had nothing on their resume that would even get them through the door of their own HR requirements. So we built a spring internship, which is a three week micro internship program um, that students mostly for first and second year students can get a resume credential. They can have an experience at a company. They get a challenge project from the company. They work collaboratively to solve that challenge. They're able to uh, meet leadership at the organization, present, uh, and really gain that resume credential, and in their case, the confidence that they need to say, hey, I belong here, I can do this, uh, and then they have something on their resume that gets them through that first door so they can get a interview um, and talk meaningfully about what it means to work in the tech industry because they've been there, they've walked the halls, they've been on the Zooms. Um, and so that's been a really uh, impactful program, both the students' ability to get 
uh, indoors that they wouldn't have gotten into, but also for the companies to see talent they wouldn't necessarily see because they wouldn't make it through their initial hiring screen. So we found it to be a really important way to both uh, prepare students differently that uh, they haven't had uh, access to certain opportunities, but also start to change the mindset of folks at the company. Um, and we've now been seeing companies who are using sprint internships as a direct pipeline to their internship program um, because they're not coming in through the traditional doors or creating new doors for them to come through. Wonderful, thank you. And Raul, uh, Knight Foundation has obviously played such an important role in so many key cities throughout the country. Your own uh, perspective? Yeah, I, I'd just love to continue the, the thread on systems that Debbie and others have been calling out. Um, and <clears throat> at one point in the prior panel, this conversation kind of comes up. Uh, I think Suji kind of called it out. He's like, listen, we've been talking about this marketplace forever. Listen, FIU as an institution is massive, 60,000 students. The School of Computing at FIU will be the largest school uh, at that university within the next five years. That is wild growth in any academic setting, um, but, but particularly in Miami. And what, it, what it's responsive to or reflective of is demand from community, right? That growth is coming because more Miamians are seeking out careers in tech. And to, to kind of continue Debbie's, there, uh, Debbie's kind of flow there, I think like we need better systems, like full stop. We need better, more interconnected, and I would argue industry and market aligned systems. And so when I think of FIU, I think not only of what happens in the classroom, which is, is critically important, not only what happens extracurricularly, uh, you, whether it's UPE or, or uh, complementary programs like Breakthrough Tech and, and CodePath and others that work in universities to supplement what's, what's happening in, in that setting. I also think of what we normally would call career services, right? Um, I don't think, and this is true nationally and not to, not to pick on FIU, you all know that, that we love you uh, and we're big believers and in your corner, but nationally, universities and colleges need to do a very serious self-examination and, and reflection on what career services looks like. Um, I think that's especially true for MSIs. I, in, my, in my experience, the model for a career services office has not changed since the GI Bill was introduced. Typically, you walk into some space, there's a clipboard, you put your name down, and then somebody who has not worked in industry for 20, 30 years is supposed to tell you how to make the right choices around how to break in, how to break through. Sorry to rip off your name, Debbie. Um, but literally, how do you get in? At an MSI, um, at a place like FIU that makes America plausible, right? Places like FIU make America plausible. That gap, that kink in the pipeline is horrific, right? Because we've put so much work and effort and not just us as community, but these students have to then not be able to break through because social capital isn't equally distributed. And that's where I think FIU and universities and colleges and particularly the career, what we call career services, those programs, those offices within universities, that's where there's an incredible amount of leverage that has not been exploited. It's mo in most cases, I think career services are seen as a cost center at the university apart and detached from the journey of the student. It's a, it's a little sprinkling on top. I think we have to reimagine entirely the system, um, the, the, the journey, and we have to make it customer focused. There are two customers here, the student who is paying tuition and a company who hopefully is gonna hire that student. How do we completely reimagine career services and advising so it is customer centric, customer first, designed for the, for the, the, the days that we live in, the time we live in, the market we live in, and, that at the end of, of, of it all, we see outcomes like people being connected. That is a marketplace, right? If, 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 if we have to think about standing up a different marketplace that's outside of these systems, outside of something like an FIU or another college, um, we're, we're missing the boat, right? This is literally the, the meat and potatoes of what a university is for. Um, it's a function that we got to invest in. We got to reimagine that product. Thank you, Raul. And from the city of Chicago, Hainana. Thoughts on the question? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Uh, so back to Debbie's and Raul's point, uh, in order to make the students put something on their resume that is valuable by the industry partners or other customers, um, at UIC, uh, we, we are one of the most diverse universities in the country. So we decided to leverage that and prepare the futures of tech 
uh, to believe in themselves, that they have enough experience to shoot for the jobs that they often will shy away from. So in order to do that, we, uh, we have two different efforts at um, our department mainly. Uh, the first one is that we identified wearable tech as an emerging field that gives us the opportunity uh, to put people from various different backgrounds into one group to work in interdisciplinary groups in order to mimic more of what in a startup or what an industry setting will look like. So what we've started doing is that we've invited all students from all College of Engineering and Computer Science to work together. We give them very short projects, often two weeks time limits, and um, we encourage them all to bring their own expertise and collaborate together in order to build wearable tech devices and develop their user interface and come at and essentially come up with a product that our students often take on a challenge and actually build an ad for it as a result as well. And our pre-course surveys and post-course surveys show that the students actually after this challenge believe that they're more prepared uh, to work in an industry setting, to work with people from various different backgrounds and to shoot for those opportunities that are available to, to them out there. And our, our post course surveys show that these type of experiences, especially from the class are the ones that are being mainly highlighted during their job interviews and often leads to successful internship or job opportunities for them. And I, I totally agree with Raul in, in regards to career services needing to improve. So one other thing that we've done is that we've developed our own professional development course where we actually bring in our alumni with various different expertise to guide our students and to talk to them. Before Zoom was popular, we would bring, the, bring them in uh, with Facebook Live in order to interact with our students and tell them about what their life and their challenges are like at industry settings. And that would often create a, a unofficial mentorship partnership between the students and those alumni that would actually lead into successful um, internship opportunities for them. Uh, we also leverage our student organizations such as IEEE MBS um, initiatives that we have so that our students connect globally with mentors through their official mentorship program uh, throughout the globe so that you know we have students who go on for various different opportunities internationally. Uh, so these are our more local initiatives. Wonderful. It should also be stated, uh, the, uh, in line with this discussion, uh, the purpose of this fly-in seminar, uh, we think, and we're very passionate about uh, these students from all different disciplines, is very new school uh, career services. The purpose of this fly-in is to connect them with them internship sites here in Washington, D.C. that are tackling the future, uh, hopefully to secure internships, to give them that experience, whether they obviously go back to Miami uh, and help build a richer uh, ecosystem or here. So uh, I know Raul uh, has a quick stop. He will be pleased to know that UPE is well represented in our uh, seminar group here. Uh, but quick, uh, in really just a few words uh, with our four panelists, uh, what Raul, you touched on some challenges already. Any additional challenges uh, and thoughts from Francisco, Debbie, or uh, Helena that, uh, that are a challenge that need to be addressed? I'm I'm a huge believer in I love this group by the way shout out to UP um, everyone's in the messages I love it um, I, I'm a huge believer in what's happening right now in this moment in Miami and FIU I think is is at the center of it in many ways because so much is being questioned the city has a really unique moment and FIU has a really unique opportunity for leadership uh, in reimagining better systems that's that, that's what it comes down to right. Uh, in reimagining how it shows up in community, how it shows up in a student's life, in a family's life, what it means to advance mobility uh, in, in this city. And so I, I see it as massive greenfield. I see it for sure it's gonna be challenging, but I see it as opportunity, right? And, and in many ways, um, this may not have been um, how we, we thought that Miami would, would, would come onto the scene, uh, courtesy of, of Twitter in some ways, really behind the scenes, decades of work by many people, including FIU, to build up the capacity of the city uh, and its talent pipelines. Um, but I, I, I cannot imagine, 
I don't know of any other American city that has the opportunity set in front of it that Miami does. Miami has this incredible opportunity set right now. It feels like once in a century to build systems for the way the world is. And the reason I think we have that chance is because it feels, whenever I go in the city, it feels like the city expects more, demands more, wants more. And so pressure from community, you see it in the enrollment at the Knight School of Computing at FIU, right? Demand from community for more, for better, for access, to be participants in what's happening, in creating the city, in this case, through tech, that is at an all-time high. And so when that kind of pressure builds, as, I, as I'm, I'm noticing it in a good way, I think it's a healthy tension. I think that it gives a, a huge kind of, I don't say blank check, but a huge invitation, let's call it, for leadership like institutions uh, at FIU, for example, like institutions like FIU to step up and say, all right, we're going to do this together. We're going to build this together with community, with students, with industry. We're going to get this right. And it's going to be a model for the rest of the country. Wonderful. Francisco, Debbie, and Anna. I would agree with Raul what's saying. I think what we're seeing in Miami is an incredible convergence between, you know, government in initiatives, educational institutions coming together, businesses coming together, students, so, and the capital, right? So when, when all these things come together, there's nothing we cannot really do. And this, and this really is a way to address this systemic nature of this problem that Mark and, and, and Suji and others were referring to. So I, I certainly think that what we, the other thing is maybe as a challenge, an additional challenge maybe for, for us to be, think about through is how we move from seeing students as the clients to seeing students as a product. Because all organizations have moved from sales to what they call customer success today. And, and what means is they move from pushing a product down to the door, I mean, out of the door to really ensuring there is adoption and usage and success out of the use of that product by organizations. So, the responsibility and accountability of the educational institutions cannot end where it ends today on one end. And I think organizations need to get much closer and invest their money and time in helping educational institutions to get a much more um, ready to plug in product in the market. Abby? Um, I'm thinking of, uh, challenges, there's a ton of operational challenges of trying to work in a space where the systems don't meet. And I have colleagues on the call here from, I think I saw our Breakthrough Tech DC site uh, who are well aware of all the challenges that they face every day trying to do this work. Um, but one thing that really gives me hope is uh, that these systems are all made up of people uh, and relationships. And uh, we've seen from our sprint turns that they've gone on to um, get internships about 30% of them in the companies that they uh, had their sponsorship in, but about 70% in other companies, which means uh, the, the social capital that they're getting is helping them around the, the regions that we're working. So we have 20, 30, 40 companies at a time hosting sprinters. And so they're now seeing different students from different universities and seeing the value of that diversity and the value of giving different students a chance to get access uh, and so that growth of uh, exposure and relationships, I think, is part of the solution to the systemic challenges that we face. And last but not least, Anana. Uh, all right. Um, thank you uh, for all the comments. And um, I, I just like to say, as an educator, one one thing that is really highlighted as a challenge after the pandemic is uh, that the mental need of our student body, especially the most diverse student body, has significantly changed. Uh, so what could be an interesting opportunity is to provide uh, training for someone like me who comes from an engineering background who doesn't have these sort of trainings on how to be able to support, to challenge these students, but still give them the support that they need with their special needs. So that's something that I think is worth thinking about. All very good points. Thank you so much. And we want to thank this panel. Um, very uh, nice, uh, diverse uh, missions, but all colliding on this very important question. So uh, we want to thank you all. And uh, if there's ever any way uh, FIU can be a, a continued service to, you know, to your own missions, we, we look forward to keeping up the dialogue and also 
um, you know, spreading, spreading the, uh, the dialogue with all of our university partners on the line. So thank you so much. And to wrap up our uh, uh, wonderful morning here, uh, as uh, Dr. Isler mentioned, uh, this is the final week of the White House's Time Is Now uh, challenge. Uh, we've heard, especially in this last uh, panel, a lot of talk of uh, 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 systemic issues, uh, but challenges, but also opportunities. Uh, we wanted to give uh, some of the last words to uh, really in quick 30 second uh, clips, uh, one each of our leaders for, uh, from our student group uh, that'll be leading the policy hackathons. So I believe uh, first, uh, just to give you a taste of what they believe they'll be proposing. Tomorrow morning, uh, tomorrow afternoon, uh, thanks to the uh, collaboration with uh, Amazon and Amazon Web Services will be uh, they will be tackling these uh, these questions uh, at their facility, uh, and we will also be broadcasting uh, live via Facebook uh, and packaging all of their responses, and they'll be submitting them to the White House. Uh, I believe, I'm not sure what order we're going, but who is going first? Kayomi, maybe? Uh, yes. Hi, my name is Kiyomi Cabral. I'm representing Group 1 um, called the Tax Force. I'm a sophomore here at FIU. I'm studying International Relations and Global Education Studies, and we chose to focus on the topic of education and workforce training, addressing the inclusion of racial, ethnic, and genders. So essentially within our policy hack, we've included topics such as um, providing more resources for not only K through 12, but for um, college students as well. And we've also tried to take a different approach to the workforce and providing perhaps um, training to these workforce individuals in terms of giving them information on how to work tech and how to implement tech within the workforce and within the company that they are working for. And then furthermore, with the education aspect, we are focusing more on the minority, low income and genders. Um, in terms of providing more resources and providing more tech exposure, which is something that we um, a lot of the panelists spoke about within the K through 12 education system, because a lot of students aren't exposed to, te to tech, which leads to less of these minority students applying to tech ma um, majors, which ultimately leads to the lack of diversity within the workforce. So those are just some of the topics that we're addressing within our policy hack. Wonderful. Christopher? How are y'all doing? Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Christopher Lu. I'm a computer science major at Florida International University. And we focus in on how to urge the large um, tech companies um, to implement mentorship programs that would promote diversity and equity um, by focusing mainly on, minor on minority and underrepresented communities. So for example, we have um, the Google software product sprint that I did during the summer that is uh, a program that is specifically focused for non-traditional um, universities. I wanna say since most companies focus on um, students from Harvard, um, MIT, those large companies and exclude smaller universities, which in turn um, exclude underrepresented students. So creating these mentorship programs that target those population will um, increase and diversify the workforces in which uh, we need to push forward. Okay, wonderful. Uh, Nicholas, and please. Hello, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Nicholas, Hi, good welcome. morning. My name is Nicholas Gonzalez. I'm a computer science student at FIU. Also a double major studying mathematics as well. And the president of UPE at FIU and the leader for group two for this DC fly-in. So our policy hack proposes to advocate for the creation of an organization that will provide education and grant opportunities for minority tech and entrepreneurs. Because we see that there are several opportunities for mentorship programs, but there's no general consensus on resources to fund minority startup initiatives in the tech sector. And we also look to provide technical support for these minority businesses to ensure that they don't fall behind into a digital divide due to either funding or a knowledge gap of not being introduced to these technological topics. So this will ensure that they can sustain their ground and their local economy with businesses that may already have access to these resources. Wonderful. Thank you, Nicholas. And last but not Thank least, you. Maria, you're live. Hi. 
My name is Maria Hirado. I am a PhD candidate in computer science studying cybersecurity under Mark Finlayson. Our policy hack addresses the gap in the pipeline between students securing STEM degrees and securing the jobs that they need. We view one of the biggest barriers for underrepresented college students entering tech is the lack of access to professional networks. Our policy hack, after hearing the discussion today, involves a supported mentorship program that would prepare students for the hiring process, guiding them to adapt their skills and prepare them for interviews. But more importantly, this program would give access to the professional networks that underrepresented minorities, especially first-generation STEM students, so sorely lack. Wonderful. So more to come on all four of those proposals. Uh, once again, on behalf of FIU, uh, we thank everyone for joining us today and tuning in on Zoom or Facebook Live. Uh, on behalf of our uh, fellow uh, minority serving institutions and HBCUs that were uh, joining us as well, uh, we're glad you are able to, to join us and we look forward to, to future discussions. Uh, thank you very much to STEM Connector for collaborating with us. Uh, all of our panelists on both, uh, in particular, uh, UMBC and the University of Illinois, uh, Chicago, uh, Verizon, SoftBank, Breakthrough Tech, and of course, our great friends at the Knight Foundation. We thank you very much, and we thank all of our students uh, for uh, sticking with us and hopefully using this discussion to, to help uh, form some of their own uh, policy solutions. Thank you all very much, and have a great day.